Well, hello everyone. Welcome to today's trust seminar. This is Brilliance and Commerce, House of Freedom International Natural Law Trust Seminar for May 20th, 2020. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We will have uh, in the speaker window, you should see Randall Hildner is joining us and I'm Dominique Hackett and Randall is my mentor and I'm stepping in today just for Tonson um, in order to be the hostess of Randall's trust seminar for today. We will all be enjoying the continuing conversation regarding trust asset protection through proper trust administration. During this transition phase where it feels like our whole planet is moving from a dark age to a golden age. <laughs> Thank you for co-creating with us. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so this is Brilliance and Commerce, and Brilliance and Commerce is a project of La Verite. Uh, we have a flagship, House of Freedom International Natural Law Trust, and the Liberty Debt Elimination System. The Brilliance and Commerce has many affiliate and special offers regarding wealth building systems, credit repair, and much more. And if you've been on our website, you've probably seen this. Brilliance and Commerce is signatory to the Worldwide Charter for Fair International Commerce from the International Business Standards Organization. And if you go on our website, you can check this out further if you've not already seen it before. So today's seminar, is on trust administration and the next seminar will be june 17th so mark your calendar to make sure you don't miss it and to see playbacks of past seminars you can go to www.brilliance-videos.com and all of randall's playback seminars are right there so i'm uh stepping in for Tonson, and um, we want to remind you that uh, Brilliance and Commerce has a YouTube channel, and that's where the replays are. And if you have not signed up for the newsletter, please go to houseoffreedomtrust.com and click the newsletter sign up. And if you need a telephone number, we also have a telephone number available as well. So, Tonson Fairmont is the founder of Brilliance and Commerce. He is a consultant and he consults on bank instruments investment programs. He's a speaker and he's also an author, just an amazing gentleman. And his newsletters that he sends out about once a month are just full of incredible information. So, I highly recommend that you sign up for the newsletters if you haven't already. So for those of us who are joining us for the first time with these seminars with Randall, welcome, welcome. Um, these seminars have been, Randall has been uh, putting on for, gosh, over a year now, Randall, maybe a year and a half. And we, it's about the private irrevocable trust that uh, we call the natural law trust that the wealthiest families have used and we follow the principles that are based on time-tested experience for decades, perhaps even centuries. And uh, we're working internationally in most countries, especially the English-speaking ones. And what we're working on is asset protection through correct trust administration. And Randall explains the details of all this. So, um, we changed from just calling it a common law trust to more of a natural law trust to emulate what is universal a little bit more. But it's still what is commonly known as common law. And nevertheless, it complies with the Uniform Commercial Code and is harmonizing the best statutory principles and traditions. And even though the trust itself does not derive its authority or jurisdiction from any statutory law, it is therefore independent of that and it's even known as what is sovereign. So it has the best of all worlds in the sense that it is international, it's global and not subject to a particular jurisdiction. 
It does not subscribe to attorney requirements or state requirements. It is private and it is still operating under the legal principles that all countries must abide by. That is our universal right to enter into contract between two people. So Randall, who is our keynote speaker, is the director of the Trust Department for Beards and Commerce. He is the founder of the House of Freedoms Trust and uh, White Light Unlimited. He was the trustee for One's People's, One People's Public Trust and creator of the International Natural Law Trust. He is the favored trust writer and consultant, client caretaker, and speaks via Skype with people in various countries all over the world. With a majority of clients in North America, Brilliance and Commerce also has clients in Australia, Indonesia, France, Germany, England, many countries all around the world. So Randall, I'm so happy to help co help co-host this. I'm Dominique. Yeah. Cat <laughs> and I have the honor of being mentored by you. I am just, oh, wow. I'm so grateful. <laughs> just been so, waiting for you to show up. <laughs> Such a delight. So today's webinar is on Trust Administration Part 2. And we'll start with the first slide. Hey, well, welcome, everybody. This is your old friend Randall, and I'm really appreciating that Dominique is uh, here to uh, be the host, and I'm still able to be a co-host. Tanzan is moving actually down closer to Dominique, Santa Barbara. He's going to a happy home down in warmer climate. And uh, both uh, Dominique and Tanzan have uh, been trying to get them to come back to Hawaii so we can all be available a lot more locally, but we'll see how that goes. Anyway, to begin today's little show, and uh, it's been a beautiful day here, and um, I'm glad you're all here. So what we're doing today is we're uh, continuing on from something we started last month, and we're talking about the responsibilities of the trustees and how they're, uh, you know, what they're under, what the, the construct, the requirements are, whether it's uh, in the trust document or under trust law. So in general, uh, when you choose, when you come, let's go back a little bit. And uh, when you come and get a, a trust with us, it's a contract between you and at least two other people, uh, a trustee and a grantor. Typically, uh, clients come and they are going to be the grantor, and then uh, they provide either two friends or one friend and one family member uh, to be the trustees, and then they have maybe themselves as beneficiary or maybe uh, projects or, um, Part, you know, different members of the family. Sometimes people choose to uh, have a, find somebody, a friend, or in the case of Dominique, she uh, does do grantor service. So either your friend uh, or somebody else in your family can be grantor. You could be a trustee uh, and then with another fr uh, non-related friend. Um, you could be the trustees and then the beneficiaries could be children, projects, or yourself, as long as you're got a co-trustee. So the, back to in general, basically the trustees must conform to the trust document and trust law. Now, trust law is fairly standard. What we're doing over the course of almost a, uh, at least a half a year, and we'll probably continue into the rest of the year, is we're going through basically the requirements to make a complete natural law trust. Now, if you already have the document and you uh, go through responsibilities and requirements for the trustees, you'll see that they're pretty clear 
they're very intentional and um, that's the requirement that is necessary for you to be a competent trustee or if you've chosen somebody else that that's their requirement to provide the correct process so that this trust can run without any or let's say in the beginning minimal hiccups and then over a period of time then you've pretty much brought it up to speed and uh, you're pretty well cooking with good gas. Uh, so that's the basis of that. Um, when you look, uh, you know, your the the authority of how you're required to perform uh, is authorized. 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 Got confusion. Must have too much salt water in my mouth. <laughs> is the action authorized? Okay. So is the action authorized? Yes. It's in the trust document. The authorization comes from the document itself, and it comes from the intention of the grantor and the intention of the other trustees, the document, and it must go, it must be within the construct of trust law. Now, I'm the one that does the research on trust law, been working at this for 30 plus years, probably longer. And um, it's, it's in, uh, as Dominique can verify, it's a fairly daunting process because you have one book that's uh, probably 200 pages, which is a beginning, and then you graduate into uh, trust law and you go out and you buy, you know, a thousand dollars worth of trust law books and you go, oh, there's a lot more here than meets the eye. And sure enough, there's lots of trust law that you must at least look at and understand that it is there so that when you're, uh, say you are the trustee, then you're acting according to the document and the trust law. Now, it, there is a very broad authorization. In other words, you're going to run, the trustees can run this trust as if you were running your own private business and your own, uh, you know, honest endeavors. In other words, a trust can do anything that any person can do as long as it's not illegal. Of course, we know that from a personal level that you don't want to step out of the boundaries. Or if you do step out of the boundaries, you have a sense of what you're doing. So you know where you're gonna go over the line. So there's your authority right there. It's the trust law and the trust document. So I was um, just consider, I don't, I can't see how many people are aboard today right at the moment, but um, if you we do- have about 17 participants. Okay, good. Well, welcome, 17 participants. It's good to have you here. If you have one of our documents, then you're great. And if you don't, then consider getting one sooner than later. Okay, so we're on uh, the decisions that are consistent with fiduciary standards. Okay, what's a fiduciary? That's somebody that takes responsibility to make sure that the the laws that are needed, fiduciary laws, are the responsibility that you're going to carry on um, as a an honest functionary person, and you're going to carry this document, and you're going to carry the business of the document along good standard lines of working relationship with everything that you do, uh, whatever contract you let's for this moment for this example you're a trustee whatever you feel uh that uh, would enhance the trust asset that's your fiduciary responsibility your uh duty is to make sure that those assets are protected and enhanced and if they're uh, not supporting uh, the asset base of the trust 
and they can be uh, sold or discarded or traded uh, what, however you would do it in your own personal life, as long as it's done according to above the law standards. And also, the second part of the standard decision is that you have a duty to the beneficiaries. So not only are you beholden to uh, be a responsible fiduciary, but you're also a part of that fiduciary responsibility is to make sure that the beneficiaries receive the benefit from the trust that the intent of the grantor has put in place. In other words, oftentimes I have people come to me and they, they have an estate uh, whether it's a uh, property, uh, real estate property, or a personal property, could be artwork, could be gold, silver, could be a significant trading account. All of those are enhanced or looked over and taken care of by the trustees. So you have a duty to uh, protect and enhance the asset, and you have a duty to the beneficiaries. Okay, that covers that slide. Next slide, please. Okay, terms of the trustee's responsibility. Now, uh, this is gonna run a number of uh, subtitles here, but we're gonna start with a duty to perform personally. Okay, so performing personally is that if you decide to be a trustee, then you have to actively and personally perform these, whatever these duties are, whatever uh, is in the trust document, whatever uh, is a duty or a power of the trustee, they're under trustee powers, that, that, that document shows that you can do these things specifically, and you have, but you have to do them on a personal level. Now, it can be, as we'll see, ministerial or discretionary. So you can, you have to perform personally at some level. If you don't have the skill in a particular aspect of something, then you have the ability to um, go and find a third party. And, uh, you can have them be part of, in other words, the, the trust can uh, have a third party perform something. So you may want the trust to uh, buy stock or trade stock, and you're not a trader, but you know you can you know how to go out and find uh, a trading company, a good company, a solid company that you think will enhance these assets that you want to use as collateral or put physically into the trading account. And um, that's what you do. So is it ministerial where you can look over things or is it discretionary? So uh, you have things that you have to do, ministerial duties, uh, it's like running uh, a church organization, you're running a trust organization, you have duties to perform, et cetera. And then you also, in our trust document, what we do is we have certain things that you have to administer, and there are certain things that you have the ability to find a third party to enhance those assets or take care of those assets or whatever it is that you've decided to do. It's, it's really getting together with, uh, let, let's say in the, in the this example that you are the trustee, you would confer before you sign the document, trust documents, you would make sure that you and the grantor have uh, agreed to do certain things. This is what the grantor wants to have happen. Uh, we also have that in the document itself. In other words, uh, the grantor is using this trust document because what he wants is covered within the document itself. And then also in that same document, which can run from anywhere from 30, 30 pages to 
40 plus pages, depending on what it is that you want to have happen. And so then it's documented and then it's time to go to work. So what's the next slide, please? Okay, what are you going to administer? All right, well, we sort of covered this. Who's gonna mow the lawn? Well, um, if you like your exercise, then maybe you would be mowing the lawn yourself. If not, then you would go and hire or look to hire a company that can come in and landscape and keep the property in its enhanced mode, whether it's a, like the picture says, it's a, a particular real estate project, or it may be um, an asset-based commodity or stock market or gold and silver, whatever it is that is in the asset base, that's what you need to look at. What's gonna go in, and that we'll get to later, what can go into the trust is any kind of personal property, and of course, any kind of real estate. So depending on uh, what it is that you wanna do, we can do that. So one of the things that I wanna say before we go too far is you can put property, personal property in, and you can put real estate in, but one thing you don't wanna do is put a liability into the trust, and that means not no car, no airplane, no boats, if you have those and they're of substantial value, we can create a second trust that would house that particular vehicle, that liability, and then it's separate from your personal property and your real estate. Okay, so that that's part of supervision of the trust. You, you've got to administer to all the aspects of whatever the asset base is whatever the asset base is within the trust. Advice of others, okay, so now you uh, have the discretion to go and find somebody to mow the lawn and take care of the, la the landscaping. You have somebody that's going to trade the stock and the bonds, and uh, you have somebody that's gonna take care of gold and silver. Whatever it is that, uh, you feel is appropriate for you to enhance and protect the property within or the asset base within the trust, that's your job. And whether you delegate it or do it yourself, it's gotta be done. And if you signed up for it, then please, by all means, do it or uh, have somebody find uh, another trustee and put in your resignation, don't be afraid to resign, but take responsibility and help that whoever it is that asks you to be a trustee, take it seriously and you'll have it. Okay, proper delegation, all right? This is where I want you to look at whether you can delegate that authority or whether you have to do it yourself. So that's all within the trust document and that will be pretty well defined. What's the proper Delegation is to find somebody, if you're not gonna do it yourself, you don't have the skill level to do it yourself, then that's what you would do. You would find somebody that can literally get that for you. Okay, next slide, please. Do you see the next slide, Randall? I do. I was just uh, moving the, the pictures out of the way. Um, <laughs> liabilities caused by the agents. Okay, so um, you you under responsibility to take care of any liability that might be caused by anybody that you have decided to uh, hire and to give advice to the trust. Um, You know, you can see from the picture that there's somebody playing around the substance of the trust and there's somebody that's really taking responsibility to orchestrate what's happening. And so that is the same with the trust document is that you want somebody to be in charge. That's the trustee duty. And you want to be able to 
delegate those around you to take care of and make sure that the asset base is protected and enhanced. Because this could go on for a long period of time. We're not talking about just one generation, we're talking possibly about multiple generations. And, uh, and as we know from past history, that uh, all the known names in the wealth of this country and even Europe, uh, trusts have been around. They've had the trust, the Rockefeller Trust has been around since the early 1900s. Uh, some of the European trusts have been around for two, 300 years. And it goes on, goes on and on and on because the reason that, one of the reasons is that you want to trust is that there's never probate because nobody ever dies. And if you die, if you pass on without your asset being in a trust, then it all has to go to probate and half of it at least is going to go to somebody else and not to your family. So one of the reasons that we want to have a trust is to avoid probate. But you also take care of liability. So make sure that um, if you have a trust with a liability in it because of, um, uh, you know, you have a car or a plane, you have a separate trust or you have enough insurance. You might uh, also remember that in real estate, if you have the trust has a piece of property in real estate, then you would want to have proper maintenance. You would want to have proper uh, insurance so that you don't create a liability. And if an agent, you've got to make sure that any liability caused by an agent is also taken care of, either by uh, trustees can sue that third party to fix any um, major snafus that happen from their mistake. And it'd be your mistake if you didn't call on that agent to fix that liability. Now you also owe a duty to other trustees. So if you have a co-trustee and you're thinking of a particular project that you wanna do, that's important that you talk it over with the other trustee. You, uh, if you want, you can talk it over with the grantor. If you want, you can also talk to the beneficiaries, but you don't have to. Uh, we're gonna go into a, a lot about the beneficiary role uh, and what they have and what they uh, can say uh, in the future, in a different episode. But for right now, uh, you and have a duty to the co-trustees and each, whenever anybody takes any action, it should also only be after you've conferred with the other trustee and you say, hey, Fred, I'm thinking about doing this and this and this. What do you think? You know, what what do you want? What do you, do you think we can enhance this? Do you think it's time to let go of this piece of property? The market's really good. Should we sell? Should we buy? Um, it's very much between you, between both trustees. Sometimes you may bring on a third trustee. I've had written trusts for three trustees, four. It's best to have an odd number because if you have an even number, it has to be unanimous, whereas if you have an odd number, it just needs to be the majority. Ideally, you don't want the trust to be more than three trustees, but it can happen. Usually by the time you need uh, that many trustees, time to break off part of the asset base and create another trust so that um, you can separate out the assets. As the Rockefellers have purported to have, you know, over hundreds of trusts, each one being broken off for a particular child, a grandchild, et cetera, all the way down the line, just keeps going out and out and out. But just have that in the back of your mind as seed, seed form right now. It uh, doesn't have to go anywhere until you have significant um, asset base. Now, uh, a lot of people may be involved with this uh, foreign currency thing. And um, if that, when and if that happens, it's going to be a significant change in your asset base. And that's the time you start to think about 
other trustees in other trusts. And of course, if you're in that, um, then you're also going to have humanitarian projects that you might want to support. And those are all going to be, um, you're going to have to have people to run those projects. In other words, there's a project for a particular uh, endeavor in your town, in your county, in your wherever you want. Uh, and you need to have that in place and ready to go and uh, assign that asset base. You'd, you'd break off or you'd list that uh, new project in your minutes. In other words, you can, you can take that new asset base and in a minute, you and the other trustees uh, have decided to support 10 new projects. And you've got uh, the abstract of the project. You've got somebody in that project that can run it, that's responsible, just like you are as a trustee. And uh, that, then you break that piece of uh, capital off, and it goes into that project. And that project is being run efficiently and effectively and on purpose. So there you go. Next slide, please. The duty under directory, prov directory provisions. That's, um, let me look at my notes here, but I think that's really your just, your, whatever it is that you're under a ministerial duty to perform, you want to make sure that you're working within that uh, the provision within the trust document that tells you what it is that you need to do for the beneficiaries. And you would you can always relate back to the trust document. You can always also uh, always email me, and I will sort out any understanding that needs to happen for you to better resolve the issue. But the idea is that you're, that's your trustee duty ship, is to make sure that you are taking care of anything within the asset base and whether you have to, you need to give it out to another skilled person so that you can uh, make that asset grow. Uh, or you do it yourself, but you do have to do work. It's not just like you sit back and you can assign everything, but as the main trustee, you need to look after, you need to check in with every project uh, every once in a while on a weekly or a monthly basis, whatever uh, just you have decided to do in the project when you set it up. You report on a monthly basis, fine. And every month you need to get a report from every one of these projects. And you put that as a minute within the trust document. Over a period of time, you're gonna have a two and three inch trust binder. And you might wanna have one specifically for minutes. And you start to, you can, uh, whatever works best for you, you can put the latest minute on top or you can turn the pages and put it in the back whatever it is you can do a monthly uh, you can have a 10 month and then a yearly process but bookkeeping is part of it and it's just keeping straight the whole workings of the trust just like you would in any business I have a number of clients come to me that have a successful business and I say, all you do is you take your business, you make, uh, you either put the business in the trust, you have the trust take over the business, and then you run it the same as you've been doing, except that now you have a couple of other advantages that I'll talk about later. And, um, but basically is that you can do more, you have more flexibility with the trust document than you have with a sole proprietor or an LLC or you know a, a corporation whether it's an s corp or a c corp but you can also have those as storefronts some of the things that i do is i have people set up a storefront 
So they have an LLC, which is running the business as a storefront. And then the owner of that LLC is yourself and the trust. And um, I worked with a client last week to get him to, he said, well, what percentage am I going to do? I said, well, it's entirely up to you. You can take whatever percentage you want. You can take, you can give the trust whatever percentage you want. It's, it's very flexible. You need to have at least 2% ownership to make it effective. And um, it runs quite well. I've done that successfully for 10, 20 years. I've run LLCs owned by the trust. I've uh, had the trust own businesses, trust his own property. And so it's very flexible. And what is the vision? It goes back to the vision of the grantor, vision of the person wanting the trust to begin with. And that's how you go about making it all happen. How that uh, next one is about duty to safe safeguard. I think I've basically covered that already, but it's your, like we've just talked about for the last half an hour is your duty is to make sure that either you or a designated or that, uh, agent is performing the duties to safeguard the trust estate, whether it's property, whether it's real estate, uh, whatever it is that you want to have going to the trust. When you have the trust document, you're going to get uh, three, there's three, well, it's four schedules, basically. The schedule A is for personal property. Under that, you would list the personal property that you want to assign to the trust might be gold and silver, might be paintings, valuable paintings, might be um, uh, stock market, et cetera. And then schedule B is for real estate. You might have a number of holdings in real estate, could be rental property, could be ownership outright property. And then schedule C would show who the beneficiaries are. So if there's a known list the beneficiaries, which is quite important. And they can be one to numerous. And then you have an addendum to Schedule A, which is for foreign currency. And we'll talk about that uh, later on as well. So your duty is to, you know, safeguard the trust estate. And it's not, it's not uh, necessarily intense because you can designate the proper people to take that responsibility, but if you do designate it, then it's your responsibility to make sure that you're always in communication with that person or that organization to make sure that um, the trust estate is well enhanced and protected. Okay, uh, is there another slide? Ah. Okay, so we're on questions and we have questions. Anybody want to raise their hand? Look at all those people gathered. <laughs> and uh, if they don't raise their hand for a question, or you can type a question in the chat window as well, and I can read it out. I've got a number of questions. <laughs> we'll step up to the mic. All right. So I don't see any hands raised on our participants. Also, um, you do have the ability to unmute yourself as well if you'd like to ask your question as a spoken question. But um, uh, if it's okay, I'll start with my question real quick. Um, is, I'm curious because um, especially with hopeful that humanitarian monies will be released, a number of us have begun our trust and we don't have that many assets. And um, in our uh, trustee study group, we've been studying the art of passing the buck. And at the end of the book, there's a comment about, you know, you really want to have at least about, I don't know, $20,000. or You need to have some uh, more substantial amount of assets to actually take care, do something good for beneficiaries and also be able to pay the trustees. Do you give anyone recommendations for what's the minimum amount of assets, Randall, 
or do you just encourage people get the trust going and accumulate assets? Yes, that, that's how it begins. Um, if you have assets already, then you can put those into the trust. If you want to accumulate assets through the use of a trust, then that's also very appropriate. But basically, you've, uh, you have an asset base. When you pay the $2,400 to get a natural law trust, then you have an asset base right there. You have invested $2,400 into a document that's going to enhance your estate. So, and then you can either put, uh, if you have uh, any other property that you'd want to put into the trust, you can do that as well. But th there's your asset base right there. And if you're serious about doing the trust, then I would uh, make sure that I started to accumulate some things that I would want to have in the trust that would stay out of my own personal pocket so that if anything happens to you, then um, you don't know anything. It's all done, it's all within the trust. So that's the beginning of building an asset base. Um, so, I, you know, again, that's a, it's up to the client and it's up to you. How much do you wanna keep on pouring into the trust and building an asset base or, you know, you don't wanna put it all in there. You want, unless you're the manager, and you want to get a pet paid a managerial fee, then you can do that as well. Um, you can you if you're going to pay your trustees, then you need to have some asset go into the trust so that the trustees can be paid. Now I remember when we first began, uh, we did we didn't have to do very much. We made the client was the manager. And he ran the daily day-to-day -day business because it was already his business. He just didn't want to have it in his name and he wanted it in the trust. So we as trustees, it's my former partner, uh, Tom Martin, very astute gentleman. And um, we would just say to the client, okay, well, we want to know once a month what's, uh, you know, some email at that time, there wasn't any email. It was, just send us a letter that this is what's been done or a telephone call. And then once a year, we would have a trustees meeting and we would say, okay, why don't you uh, take us to this restaurant and we'll have a trustee meeting and then you can buy us dinner. And that was pretty much uh, the trustee meeting for the year, which was all duly written down and signed by the trustees. So it was a little, uh, it was fairly simple, but again, we had to, uh, make sure that we connect it with the client on a regular monthly basis. Is everything okay? You know, is there any change in the assets, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I just, uh, does that help, Dominique? That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Now, I just saw a couple of questions flash, so you might. Um, let's see. So one of our first questions on the chat window is a question about leasing a car. Is there ever... Uh, a time or reason that a trust could lease a car for a beneficiary or a trustee? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I didn't get to that about ownership because it is a liability. But if you lease a car or a plane or a train or uh, a, a boat. boat, yeah, you could lease the Queen Mary and sail it across the ocean because the leasing company is the responsible party for that asset or for that liability. So that's the best way to actually uh, have the trust, uh, have a car or a boat or whatever, is to go to a leasing company. The leasing company would carry the proper insurance and it would be the responsible party. So just uh, thinking out, uh, since the trustee is supposed to be caring for the trust assets, uh, if the beneficiaries are fine, I, how would a trustee go about leasing a car for the trustee's use? Well, they would have the ability to do that on their own. I mean, they might want to confer with uh, 
the grantor. I mean, but it would be in the trust document that they have the ability to lease whatever they need. And that would be part of their compensation as being a trustee. But I, as, as a trustee, I would, um, I would make sure that the asset base of the trust warranted uh, the ability to lease that car or whatever is needed for the uh, traveling process of the trustees. And if there's a substantial estate going into the trust, then there's no reason that the trustees couldn't be compensated, whether it's through uh, a paycheck or whether it's the ability to lease a car, et cetera. That makes sense. The next question is talking about the LLCs. And uh, the person is asking, they're curious about the advantages of the trust being a member of an LLC and having the LLC as a storefront? Well, I like that concept and I think I actually brought it up to Tonson because that's what I eventually did. Uh, and I found that was really efficient. Well, this was in Hawaii uh, uh, when I first, no, let's see, no, it was for, when I was first in California. Um, I had an LLC run the business, and then the, the one of the owners of the LLC was the trust, and I was the other owner. Um, and then and my wife, when she was alive, was also the other owner. So the two of us had a minor ownership, and then um, the trust was the ownership of the rest. Now, when I got to Hawaii, uh, Hawaii charges an excise tax, and um, I realized that uh, that would come right off the top. And I figured that one of the ways to get around that would be to have uh, a different uh, setup. And so I stopped doing the LLC here and I just ran uh, that particular aspect, the consulting business out of the trust and it seemed to work well. So it, the storefront is really, I like that because there's a, a lot more separation between the asset and the trust. So the, the storefront is just, you know, it's like a physical storefront. And you have the merchandise is in the front part and the bookkeeping is in the back, back store, back office. And that's basically what you see when you go on a web page. you see the storefront and then you have your back office if you're a member of um, you know, your process. You have a desktop and then you have a, a back, back office. Beautiful. Does that help? Is Very helpful. So okay. it, it's uh, separating out possible liabilities. Yes, yes, even more so. Nice. So uh, we have another question and it's in regards to is there a glossary of terms that are included with the trust to help understand the language in the trust? Well, I haven't at the present time, but there is a bibliography and within that bibliography, there is um, a couple of those books have glossaries of terms, but that's a very good point. And I will endeavor to put a, uh, get a glossary and put it on the bibliography. And so if you, or looking for that specifically, please uh, send me an email and I will make sure that that happens sooner than what we get posted on the website. Beautiful. It looks like, um, looks like um, the picture is Kauai. <laughs> Someone was thinking of you. <laughs> yes, the boats are all coming into Hanalei. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> I also know um, in the Art of Passing the Buck, they have a pretty good glossary in the back of that book as well. Yeah, and that's on the bibliography. But what I, I will figure out how to get a biblio, I mean, a glossary of terms um, and have it as uh, unique, its own little unique uh, bibliography section. I'd be happy to help make that happen. <laughs> We can do it together. We can work together. Yes. That will be part of your internship. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, somebody told me we've been seeing dolphins lately, and somebody told me that they actually 
also saw a whale. They were bringing their boat around and they saw a whale, uh, which is really late in the year uh, for Kauai. Usually the whales have left and gone back to the colder waters to feed, but um, wow. it's been, been an incredible spring here. Oh, that's so beautiful. Why to me not being able to stay on my bike occasionally. <laughs> okay, our, other questions? Sure. Our next question is about, can this trust form another separate trust? And if so, how? Okay. So you start to collect an asset base and um, you think it's getting too large and you want to separate some of the assets out. Then the trustees would create a, a new trust. They're, they're now the grantors of the new trust, and uh, they would choose a new set of trustees. Now, since you're being offering a trustee service, one of those trustees could be um, could be one of the trustees, one of the present trustees, and your trustee service, and that would qualify a separation, especially if they were not the beneficiaries. So let's say that the um, original beneficiaries are not related to the trustees. Uh, they wanna create another trust, trustees do. So they create a second trust, or maybe a third even, and they, one of the trustees would be the new, the trustee of the new trust, and let's say your trustee, your tr trustee service, or a friend of the original grantor could also be the new trustee. So it's fairly easy to do. And again, I would be, if anybody has a question of doing that, then if you email me, then I would be much more specific. I can lay it out in an email so it's a little more coherent. And that, actually, that could be a slide. We could probably do a, a, a whole seminar on uh, how the managing trust then creates smaller trusts, and in particular, how to help understand the interaction with the beneficiaries. Yes, okay, got it. We can do that. So I can give a, a follow-up question to this as well. Um, when the managing trust, I'm going to call the first trust a managing trust, when the managing trust decides it's time to break up into smaller trusts, do they need to get uh, a uh, signature or approval from the beneficiaries in order to do that? Or is this part of their care of the beneficiaries and there's a way to ensure that perhaps beneficiaries get split up between the asset base into other trusts? Yes. Well. It would, the beneficiaries would follow the new trust. If, if it's part of the asset base of the present time trust, trust number one, and uh, there's a trust number two is created, those beneficiaries would stay the same unless they all decided that there would be some new beneficiaries. Uh, maybe the present beneficiaries of trust number one uh, have children and they're going to create the second trust for the children as beneficiaries. So that's a possibility as well. There are multiple possibilities. So it's really a fluid, fluid process. Children are born, new trusts are established. More children are born, more trusts are established. That's what the Rockefellers and the Kennedys and all the big guys do forever. Does that help? Yes, that helps very much. And then um, a, another follow-up question. When you're working with your trust and you get to the, uh, what is it, 21 year mark? Because you can't yeah. have a trust go on uh, in perpetuity. Uh, right. Is it just a matter of a meeting with the trustees and the beneficiaries and everyone signs a minute saying, let's do this again for another 21 years? Right, and the beneficiaries, if they decided not to do it, then the beneficiaries would have to be unanimous in agreeing that the asset base would be broken up on a pro rata basis and then the trust would dissolve. Perfect. 
Um, I don't have another question in the chat. Oh, but I have a hand raised. Hang on one second. Let's see. Unmute. Hello. Uh, let's see. The guest name is Galaxy J3 Orbit. <laughs> this is Dominique. I think I've unmuted you. Would you like to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, I, uh, uh, I just wanted to know, um, Dominique, um, la uh, last time you were on a call that I was on, you said you can offer trustee services, and then now they're saying you also can offer grantor services. Do you offer, can you offer both to the same trust? Um, so Randall's my mentor, and through that process, when he finds a client who is best served by having a nominee grantor, um, then there are times where I will have my company be the grantor, and then if that client also needs what's called an adverse trustee, then we'll talk about it, and if it's the right fit, I will uh, come on board as one of the trustees, not the sole trustee, but one of the trustees, in order to add a trustee who is not related to the beneficiaries. So yes, I, I have a way to do that. Yes, and she's very good at it. I don't doubt it. That's super cool. Okay, so um, can we contact you directly, Dominique, or do we need to get our trust started going with Randall first? You get your trust started with Randall, and then he'll look at your setup, and he'll help make a, a good recommendation for you. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Sure. And I, I'm just checking to see. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I've got more questions for you. <laughs> My list of questions is endless. Uh, in our class, we have not yet gotten to the trustee administration of uh, how do you handle talking to your beneficiaries? And this is my thought, uh, Randall. I don't necessarily want to get into the specifics of that per se, because we can work on another seminar for that. But when you're thinking about the beneficiaries for your first trust, is it possible, Randall, that you might recommend that people make it mainly humanitarian projects if they're waiting for funding and some small portion that is for beneficiaries that's going to get broken out and this is what i'm struggling with is i know beneficiaries have to be properly uh, uh designated but i also know they're supposed to be informed of what's in the trust so um do you understand my quandary on that yes i do um it's fairly common and uh typically we do i've been suggesting about uh, if you have a lot of humanity humanitarian projects, which I for one have a number of, um, I, I'm suggesting about 80% of beneficiary be assigned to humanitarian projects. And they can just say humanitarian projects at this time. And as long as you have those projects listed somewhere, like I have a binder full of uh, vetted projects. In other words, these are all, um, They've been looked at, they've been, you know, termed to be definitely, you know, set up properly. And so I know that when uh, the asset base becomes significant, that I can just break away into all of these particular projects. And I have another uh, bunch of projects here on Kauai that um, I'm, I go out and I say, look, I need, I want to potentially fund your project and I need a two or three page abstract of what that project would be, who's in charge, et cetera, what the, the cost outlay would be, et cetera, et cetera. So that can go, that would be listed on schedule C of trust number one. And that let's say you put 80% humanitarian projects and the other 20% would be broken up however you want. Uh, some people um, only have one other beneficiary. Uh, some people may have uh, multiple beneficiaries under that 20%. It, it's very, very fluid. And, um, and again, that, that could be a half an hour conversation on a, on a different you know, Zoom, a Zoom talk. 
we could break that out. But that the essence of it is, is yes, you could list anywhere from uh, five to 80%, 85% even, even if you wanted to say 90%, let's say you have significant uh, potential asset base coming on and you say, I want 90% to go to these projects. I already have uh, enough money uh, that I don't need much anymore. And it may all go, most of it may go to those projects, which is totally fine. Beautiful, thank you. Then it's like, it's almost like your, uh, this natural law trust has actually become quite a charitable foundation. And you'll find that within the document is that there's a whole section on the trust has the right to give to any charities at any time, anywhere in the world or out of space for that matter. And um, do the trustees make a charitable donation based on a suggestion from the grantor or a suggestion from beneficiaries? Well, you'd have that established in the beginning. In other words, when the client sets up the trust, they would say, I want uh, uh, so much to go to these projects and I want so much to go to these other beneficiaries. That's all kind of established by the, before I write the trust so that you have something of substance before uh, changing it. It doesn't mean you can't change it. You can change all of this in the course of time and it may change in the course of time. Trustees may change in the course of time. Same with the beneficiaries. Some of the beneficiaries may pass on. So um, it's very fluid, it's very flexible but you want to have something established in the beginning uh, to make it concrete and fit within the law of trust and the duty of the trustee. Beautiful. We have another question uh, that's asked, who vets your projects? Is that vetting a requirement or recommended? And what kind of qualifications for projects were you looking for? Oh, that's a long story. Uh, these projects came to me through um, uh, a gentleman that um, is very involved with the humanitarian project scene. And he has a uh, hundred projects that have been okayed as far as the people, the budget, the people that are going to run the project, the essence and the standard of uh, performance has all been looked at and so they are accepted as a valid humanitarian project. So I don't really, I didn't inquire about the vetting of the projects. Uh, I trust this gentleman and so I'm just going on the fact that uh, he's presented these projects and they, it, they're all titled. They look like, oh, this is something I would want to support. And so it's up to me to make sure that when these, this uh, new uh, asset base happens that I can uh, really feel that I can write a check to begin that process for that particular project. Now the projects that I have here on the island, um, I know them personally. Um, so I've gotten their abstract I know who to talk to. I've been involved with these gentlemen before, so there's no question that I wouldn't be able to f fund these particular projects. I think as long as you know the people involved with the project, you trust it. Um, I have a lady friend and she wants to do certain things, very humanitarian projects, and there's no doubt in my mind that she, she wouldn't carry through with it and that she wouldn't do it. So it's basically up to you to do your own vetting, to inquire and make sure that the people involved and the money involved is something that you value. I guess vetting is like valuing. That's awesome. In my experience with uh, various business practices and accounting practices, uh, we've always followed the procedure of you create a procedure and you try to be consistent 
in your application of it. So perhaps when people start vetting, if they've never done it before, write down the things that are most important to yourself. And you can even go on various websites that actually uh, investigate various nonprofits and charities and review how e effective they are in fulfilling their missions. So there's, there's a number of ways that you can gather information for yourself to create some standards that you personally are looking for that could right. become your procedure for vetting your projects. Sure. It's your, it's your money, it's your asset base, and you want to make sure that it goes where the good intention is. And your good intentions are vital, and the intentions of the project are vital. So it's your project. I love it. And it's all documented in the minutes. Yes, definitely document every decision, every every time there's a turn coming up that has a significant in, potential significant um, application to the trust that it's written down. And um, now with emails, it's easy to say for one of the trustees say, um, I'm thinking about this and um, what do you think? And it just goes out and the response is immediate. The phone conversation now with the smartphones, uh, it can be not necessarily recorded, but the, uh, the date stamp of a call to the, the trustee would be there. So it's all, um, it's all up and up. Beautiful. I love it. Uh, let's see. We have another question. Uh, oh, and let me double check. Any hands raised? Okay. Uh, I wonder if there is someone in your circle who would be available to support new projects, not having to reinvent the wheel as an advisor or maybe a consultant. Your the question is that you're looking for a project manager. I think that's probably the good term for it. Well, I would turn it back on the question questionnaire. Why is it that you couldn't be the manager of the project? And if you're not, then what is the project and who within that project would you consider to manage it? Uh, I would. I'm going to be busy enough with my own projects. And that's why every one of the projects that I'm supporting has its own manager. So I guess like my role as a trustee and I'm administering this particular project, but in that administration is to make sure that there's somebody there that can manage the project itself on a local level. So these, are gonna, these are going to be all over the world. These projects are going to, you know, be impacting all over the world. And if your project has any kind of worldwide basis, every time you go to serve money to support that project, then you're going to have a local person that will that you trust to manage that particular locale. So basically, uh, Randall, you're suggesting that uh, what we all need to do for our humanitarian projects, if we don't feel comfortable being kind of sort of at least overseeing the project manager for the specific projects, we should look to interview someone who has those qualifications. Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's to do with that term that you just said is the same as finding somebody to manage aspects of the trust and then also in the terms of the humanitarian project it's the same deal you find somebody to manage the project that you trust and you know that you you have a trust in them that they will manage correctly and that's whether it's in within the trust or within the particular project outside beyond the trust in other words, let's say these projects are going to be funded by the first trust, but they're separate from the trust itself because you are giving money to them free and clear of the trust, but you want to make sure that the money is going into a place where you know 
somebody's going to take care of it and it's going to go for supporting that particular the ideal of the project beautiful that makes a lot of sense i've got a question related to the to the picture <laughs> I have a lot of people ask about whether they should put their residence in a trust and frequently their residence has a mortgage and as an individual, if it's their first residence and their personal residence, they're getting an interest expense right off on their taxes. Do you ever help people try to decide when is it time to put the residence in a trust which then means it, uh, the mortgage follows it. Um, do you do you know kind of how that picture all works out? Um, yes, <laughs> we've done it before, and you're right. The mortgage will follow the property. The taxes, the land tax, property tax will follow the property. It will just uh, be the house will now be in the name of the trust. The mortgage is going to have to be paid for either by you or by the trust. Um, and you're either going to uh, use your own personal income or you're going to have your business uh, be part of the, the trust owner or a beneficiary of the owner. And so it's going to be paid through that means. But uh, it can be done and it can be done at any time. The uh, ideal is that when you put the house, you, you may lose some tax benefit, but ultimately with the natural law trust, you may have a significantly more benefit. So the house would now not be in your name. So if anything, if you created a liability or anybody within the household created a liability, then it would not be attached to the house. It would be on the person but the, that person doesn't own the house so that house is free of that potential liability so uh, any time is a good time to put your asset in a trust whether it's a house or a business or if it's got a mortgage on it or anything very good excellent well, that's the, the short list of questions that I had uh, here, and it is 512. If we don't have any other questions um, for today, uh, then I think we can adjourn the seminar for today and give a reminder that Randall's next seminar will be June 17th. Thank you so much, Randall, for all the wealth of knowledge that you continually pass on to us every month. I so appreciate it so much. Oh, thank you, Dominique, for stepping in for Tanzan. And um, <laughs> it's a pleasure having very feminine energy counterparting kind of my masculine energy just come out of the water from surfing. <laughs> Very, very beautiful. Very beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month, next month. on June 17th for the next trust seminar. And if you do not have your trust indenture yet, I surely hope you click Brilliance and Commerce's website and begin the process to obtain a trust. Right. At least start with the abstract. It's minimal. <laughs> minimal down payment and you get the thing going and it's happening and you can start putting assets in it and it's it's a good deal <laughs> very much very much okay aloha everyone aloha